Welcome to this uh, keynote speech by Professor Robert Costanza from Australian National University, who will be presenting uh, Valium Marine and Ecosystem Services. Uh, Professor Costanza is one of the leaders at the global level in the topic of integrating economics into ecosystem services, mainly through the challenge of valuation of these services. Currently, Professor Costanza is um, a at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University, uh, mainly leading the ecological economics uh, topics. His uh, transdisciplinary research integrates the relation between humans and the rest of nature to address research, policy, and management issues at multiple time and space scales. He is co-founder and past president of the International Society of Ecological Economics and founding editor-in-chief of Solutions, a unique hybrid academic journal. Professor Costanza has inspired many of us environmental economists for several years, and I am very pleased to introduce his presentation today. The dynamics of today's session will be as follows. First, our keynote speaker will make his presentation for about 45 minutes, and then we will open the Q&A session for the public. Uh, please remember that if you would like to submit a question, please use uh, the icon at the bottom of your screen, uh, name Q&A or Preguntas y Respuestas button, and write your question so we can uh, escalate it to our keynote speaker to answer at the end of the session. Uh, this, um, this session uh, has the possibility of being heard uh, both in Spanish or English. So if you would like to listen the session in Spanish, please also look at the icon at the uh, bottom menu and look for the interpretation uh, button that is like a, like a globe and switch to the Spanish channel. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Robert Costanza. Professor Costanza, please. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be with you all. Sorry, it couldn't be in person. Um, but um, <clears throat> yeah, and, it's, and I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity uh, to talk with you all about uh, value, the value of marine and coastal uh, ecosystem services. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my screen sharing. Um, that's the title. And as you can see, that's the uh, <coughs> that's Canberra, where I am. Uh, it's also the background for my, for my slide. So this is the, the campus of the university. Um, <clears throat> let me start by pointing out that um, we live in a whole new geologic epoch you know, called the, uh, the Anthropocene. I'm sure you've heard this term before, just to recognize the magnitude of the human impact on the functioning of, of the planet. We don't live in an empty world any longer, empty of humans and their artifacts. It's really a full, a full world. And so we have to start taking those interconnections much more seriously. Um, <clears throat> we have to recognize that uh, business as usual uh, is no longer an option in this case. Uh, we have to recognize that if our goal uh, is to create a sustainable and desirable future in the Anthropocene, we need to think and act quite differently. Oops. Uh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so we have to recognize that the time is now to build an economy based on um, uh, <clears throat> based on the changing our fundamental goal away from this mindless pursuit of GDP growth and towards uh, the sustainable well-being of humans and the rest of nature. And I put it in those terms to just to emphasize that we are a, we're a part of this natural system. If, we're, if our goal is to maintain that connection, uh, we have to start thinking in a very different way. Um, we have to recognize that there are planetary boundaries. There are fundamental ecological constraints. I'm sure you've seen some version of this of this diagram um, showing that, that in fact we are uh, you know beyond the safe operating space and several uh, of these key factors including climate including bio, uh, biodiversity including uh, the, the uh, bioge biogeochemical flows nitrogen and phosphorus etc and we're fast approaching the uh, the boundary of the safe space and several, several other of these variables um, so we have to stay within planetary boundaries at the same time we have to build a um, uh, a social floor uh, for, for this uh, 
to, to maintain the quality of life and, uh, and, and the sustainable well-being uh, for humans and the rest of nature. We know the risks that we're facing uh, from <clears throat> climate change, for example, and these are, this is from a, a recent paper just looking at the, um, the risks to coastal and marine organisms and the risks to coastal and marine ecosystem services uh, from this, this, uh, as, we, as we move up the, uh, the climate scale on the left, the, the number of degrees uh, above um, the, the, uh, uh, the average and the kinds of impacts that we can, we can expect. And we can, you can see, and I think we're all aware, of the significant dire impacts that we're facing from uh, continued climate change. Um, <clears throat> and those probably underestimate uh, the impact because we know that we're also living in a complex, adaptive, nonlinear system. There are thresholds, there are tipping points, we can expect surprises. And so any of these potential tipping points that have been identified could rapidly accelerate the, the, uh, the changes in climate that we're, that we're, uh, that we're facing. Um, so <clears throat> I think our challenge uh, going forward is not to, not to give up, uh, but certainly uh, to recognize uh, that uh, our fundamental goals need to change to sustainable well-being. In order to do that, we have to integrate um, an adequate vision, uh, first of all, of how the world is. So to bring together our scientific understanding of how the biophysical system functions, but also how human psychology functions. And, and what do we actually mean by, by well-being? And how do we sustain that well-being? So, uh, a much more transdisciplinary, I guess, approach, an integrative approach to understanding how the world functions, uh, but also <clears throat> to have a vision of how we would like the world to be. What are our goals for the future? I think that UN Sustainable Development Goals are a big step in that direction, but I think we still have a, a, a long way to go to to broaden that consensus and to and to, to get um, um, a shared vision of how we would like the world to be in this sustainable world. Our tools and analytical techniques then need to be consistent uh, with that evolving vision. And I think that's going to take much more systems thinking and modeling uh, that integrates across all these different areas. And our implementation strategies are probably going to require new kinds of institutions and strategies that, that, can, that can deal with you know, the problems that we're facing. One of the major contributors to our sustainable well-being is the, uh, the functioning of, of natural ecosystems and the ecosystem services, which are the benefits that people derive from these functioning ecosystems. This diagram is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment from 2005. Um, many of you have probably seen a version of this diagram where they uh, separate these services into these four categories of supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural services and all of their various connections, the different aspects of, of human well-being, which go far beyond just provisioning services and, and marketed activity. Uh, to providing, you know, health and good social relations, and, and uh, there's a whole range of, of uh, components of well-being that that are provided by <clears throat> by uh, natural ecosystems. Uh, there is, however, one one thing inter missing from this diagram, and that's the interaction with the other forms of capital assets that we we know are also uh, necessary uh, to create sustainable well well-being. And so this diagram uh, makes that a little more obvious. Uh, that uh, our human capital, our built capital, our social capital, and, and our natural capital are all required in some in a very complex uh, interactions uh, in order to produce well-being and ecosystem services that are the relative contribution of, of our natural capital assets to that to that interaction. Uh, so <clears throat> it's a it's a bit more complicated. It's going to take a much more transdisciplinary approach to understand services. The the X over the arrow. Uh, directly from natural capital to sustainable well-being implies that it's not just a, a linear flow. Uh, it's not just understanding how, how nature works. It's how nature works in combination uh, with the rest of, the, of this complex system. Um, and of course, it's, it's not that simple. This is a more complicated diagram uh, that tries to show how our natural capital and its various components uh, interact with the built human and social capital systems and uh, how those different services um, are, are created in, in, uh, in, in complex ways. So it's, it's, just, it, it's not simple, <coughs> excuse me. And um, the va valuing then these services is trying to put into some common units uh, what the, the degree of contribution is, something that we can compare with other kinds of, uh, of services. 
and valuing these, these ecosystem services has a range of uses um, um, listed in this table, just from simply raising awareness and making it clear that, that uh, in fact, these services are hugely important uh, <clears throat> relative to things like uh, marketed goods and services, uh, to changing our national income and well-being accounts, uh, to specific policy analysis, urban and land use, regional land use planning, uh, this idea of payment for ecosystem services, uh, that we can encourage uh, the right kind of behavior by paying farmers, for example, to plant, plant trees uh, and sequester carbon and change the water supply. It's, and there's, there's a whole host of systems around the world. Uh, I'm sure there are some in Colombia uh, that, that try to use these economic incentives to get the right kind of behavior. Full cost accounting, we know that the market is not telling us the truth about um, basically anything that we buy. Uh, because it's leaving out the external costs, the damages that we cause to these ecosystems and their, their services. And the idea of common asset trusts, uh, the, that we should think of nat natural ecosystems as uh, common assets, not as private assets, and we need to manage them in that, in that way. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting survey that was done with some um, marine and, and coastal management people in Australia uh, not too long ago, where they asked them how important they thought the, uh, the valuation of this range of ecosystem services you see on the left here uh, was, <clears throat> and you can see that in general, they thought it was very important uh, to, to value uh, not just uh, fisheries and materials provision and aquaculture, but things like uh, aesthetic benefits and research and education and habitat for species, storm protection, I'll talk a bit uh, about there. So they thought it was very important to do that valuation. They also asked them um, how much they trusted the value estimates, however. And you can see that uh, these are much less than uh, their importance. So I think in general, people think that this is an important thing to do, but um, we're not quite there in terms of doing it in a, in a way that's, that has uh, uh, generates a lot of trust, particularly uh, on things that are a little more uh, <clears throat> uh, contingent, uh, non-use values, option values, for example. Uh, carbon sequestration is certainly an important one. People still don't, don't tend to trust the valuation of, the, of those estimates. So, um, we have a long way to go. Um, there are um, a broad range of techniques that are used <coughs> me, to do this valuation, uh, ranging from avoided costs, and I'll give an example of that using that approach, uh, replacement costs, I won't go into the details of explaining uh, any of these. Uh, contingent valuation is one where people are given different scenarios and asked to say you know, how, they, how much they'd be, in a sense, willing to pay for that. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done here on group valuation. The fact that we don't want to, for, for these common assets and public goods, you don't necessarily want to ask individuals their value and then aggregate that. We want to ask the group and we want the group to have some discussion about what those values are. So there's, there's some progress being made there. And finally, on the bottom, this idea of integrated modeling. Uh, can we put together systems level simulation models that can look at uh, both the short-term and the long-term dynamics in the system and how the uh, human and, and the rest of nature uh, systems interact and how that leads to sustainable well-being. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you one uh, example that we're working on, uh, on the uh, value of coastal wetlands for storm protection. And this is a video of the storms uh, that have occurred from 1990 until 2020, each of these uh, by year. And if you can see that the uh, category five storms in the darker red and, and uh, see the scale there, uh, you can see that, that they're rapidly uh, getting more prevalent uh, as climate changes. Uh, we know that uh, these storms have significant impacts on coastal infrastructure. We also know that coastal wetlands uh, play a significant role in, in moderating those impacts. Um, <clears throat> So you could take the tracks of individual storms. This is Hurricane Katrina uh, approaching the coast of, of uh, Louisiana back in 2005 uh, and, and what its wind speed was over that over its track. Uh, we know also that in, in, uh, we've been losing coastal wetlands at a tremendous rate, particularly in places like Louisiana, where over the years from 1800s until, uh, until the current time, uh, we've lost a significant fraction of the coastal wetlands, which are there uh, as a result of sediments delivered by the Mississippi River, the Corps of Engineers has levied that river, and so the sediments are now going off the edge of the continental shelf. There's a lot of oil and gas activity uh, that's, that's led to the result 
of the loss of those wetlands. Um, ultimately, that caused the storm surge that uh, when uh, Katrina hit uh, the coast uh, to be significant, and the flooding uh, that eventually results resulted to also be significant. And we've seen this happen over and over again with, with storms, and I think it's getting worse. So one way we can deal with that is by looking at uh, for the track of each storm. Uh, we can plot, uh, and we know the wind speed, we know the area of wetlands that were, trans, uh, that were in the swath, we know the, uh, the amount of infrastructure that was in the swath by using nighttime satellite imagery, uh, and we know the amount of damage that, that each storm caused. And so we could put that together uh, into a uh, simple regression model, uh, looking at the relative damages as a function of wind speed and wetland area, and from that, we can ultimately look at the avoided cost uh, down at the bottom. What's the change in damage that we can expect from a change in, in wetland area? Um, and using that sort of relationship, uh, we can predict about 60% of the changes in the, the relative damages. And this was for the US using about 30, 32 storms that we had back in 2008. Um, and from that, we can plot then both the marginal value of a, the additional hectare of wetlands and also the total value that when you integrate under that curve. Uh, and the, 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 <clears throat> the map on the right is then an estimate of that in terms of the US dollars per square kilometer. Uh, and you can see that where the high values are or where those three elements come together, where there's a high probability of being struck by a storm, where there's a, a lot of infrastructure to protect and there's a lot of wetlands to do the, do the protecting. Um, from that analysis, uh, we, we, we uh, estimated a fairly high mean and median value across with, the, with the, uh, quite a, a big range. Um, you know, so in the thousands of dollars per hectare per year, and you can add it all up and get a total estimate of $23 billion per year in just the storm protection services of these coastal wetlands on the Atlantic and Gulf Coast of the, of the U.S. And of course, that's only one of the 17 or so different ecosystem services that those coastal wetlands provide. Uh, so making the point that investing in this natural capital and the protection of natural capital uh, is, is a good uh, investment <laughs> for society uh, because it's, it's producing um, a lot of uh, valuable services that we, we often don't recognize, uh, but that one we, once we try to, 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 uh, to, to enumerate uh, what they're doing, it, it becomes obvious that they're, they're really significant much more significant, I think, than most people realize. This was the result of uh, an early estimate of the total value of ecosystem services globally that we did back in 1997. Uh, where we looked at this list of 17 services across uh, 16 different biomes um, in the world and um, <clears throat> came up with a value in the, in the range of you know, 16 to 54 trillion dollars a year, much larger than global GDP at the time. Um, so, just to make it clear that, that uh, in fact, these services are a big deal. Uh, we didn't control what they put on the cover of the magazine. They said on the cover pricing the planet. We really didn't mean pricing as much as we meant valuing, uh, recognizing that most of these services are not exchanged in markets and shouldn't be exchanged in markets. They're really uh, public goods uh, that contribute to our, our well-being in, in other ways. But um, uh, putting those uh, values into units that are understandable by, by people, like monetary units, I think is a, uh, a real way of communicating that. The research interest in this topic of ecosystem services has been um, expanding exponentially over time. This is a plot uh, from Scopus, uh, just in terms of the number of publications by year, and you can see that as of yesterday, uh, there are about 32,000 uh, publications overall, and more than, more than 4,000 uh, per year. And about four, four and a half thousand of those were uh, studies of marine or coastal or, or uh, system. Um, <clears throat> based on that more recent research, the TEEB study, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, uh, updated some of the values that we used in the, in the uh, 1997 paper. And this is just a plot of the, the unit values, the per hectare per, per, uh, per year uh, contribution of the whole range of ecosystem services across these different biomes. And you can see that uh, coastal coral reefs, coastal wetlands, coastal systems uh, have significant uh, unit values, uh, quite a range, but still uh, a large number of, uh, of really big, big values. Open oceans are, are, are less per hectare, but of course there's a, a huge number of hectares of open ocean. So 
uh, the contributions of those systems are significant. Uh, this is just from that same study, <clears throat> uh, just quoting the, the number of estimates of each of the different, for each of the different biomes. Uh, they're still uh, <clears throat> not, um, not a huge number, uh, but enough to make some, I think, some striking conclusions uh, about the, uh, the value of these systems globally. Uh, so we use those estimates to, to look at the changes in the global value of ecosystem services from that 1997 study until, until uh, when we did this one, uh, and <clears throat> came up with a, a uh, spreadsheet uh, that looks like this. That we know that the area of each of those biomes had changed. We know that the unit values had changed as well as we had got more studies. We learned more about uh, how these systems function. I think in general, these are still underestimates of the total value because we're not picking up everything. Uh, and in general, as we learn more, there are estimates uh, increase. Um, and then we can use that information uh, to, to come up with the, the total values, either the original study updated to the, to the uh, $2,007, uh, changing just the unit values, changing just the area of, of each ecosystem, uh, or changing both. And in fact, I think it's probably the, the right way to go. And we can see that uh, from that that study, we can uh, we can get an estimate of what the, the changes were. Yeah, here's and you can see that that marine systems are a significant fraction of the the total value of, of uh, ecosystem services globally. Uh, generally, at least at least half or more. Um, and we come up with these this bottom line that uh, that our current uh, <coughs> current values are in the range of 124 trillion, uh, but. But since 1997, we've lost about $20 trillion a year in the value of ecosystem services due largely to the land use changes that I, that I mentioned, more desertification, loss of coral reefs, loss of tropical forests, et cetera. We know that when we do make these kinds of land use changes, uh, there, is, there is a significant loss in, in value. Now, uh, when we convert intact wetlands to, to intensive farming, we may get private values, but we've lost all of those social values that, that these, these systems provide. And so in general, there's a significant loss. A few years ago, we tried to estimate <clears throat> the benefit cost ratio of protecting our remaining natural capital assets. And we looked at a global scenario that in included uh, increasing our uh, global uh, reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere and 30% of the marine biosphere. And that would cost about 45 billion a year to, to build and maintain. Uh, but the benefits would be on the order of four to five uh, trillion a year. Uh, this is the, the difference between the, in, the intact system and what it might be converted to. So a benefit cost ratio of 100 to 1. That's a, that's a, that's a really good investment. Um, in terms of where we are, we know that uh, there are, uh, we, are, we do have about 30% um, or 15% of the uh, planet's terrestrial regions is now in some form of protection. Uh, but only 3.4 percent of the of the oceans. Uh, so we're pretty far away from that 30 percent that we were uh, we were looking at in our in our scenarios. And I think that uh, increasing increasing the um, uh, protected area network is certainly one way uh, to improve uh, the, the uh, benefits and protect the benefits from these ecosystem services. This is a study that looked more specifically at different kinds of uh, protected areas and what their their costs and benefits would be. And their, their uh, <clears throat> benefit cost ratios are, are generally significant in making that, that transition, you know, often, often up to 20, uh, 20 to 1 or so. Oops. Okay. So uh, looking into the future, uh, we know that, that uh, we can, in fact, make a great transition uh, to uh, a sustainable and desirable future. That's what this uh, lower right uh, scenario, and this is from the book of the Great Transition Initiative, um, and there's other scenario uh, planning work going on at the global and, uh, and other scales around the world. Um, in this one, it, it makes the, um, uh, it looks at the differences between a market forces uh, kind of scenario, the kind of business as usual, a policy reform scenario, a great transition scenario, and a fortress world scenario. And this is what these, these different scenarios kind of look like. Uh, can we can we build a sustainable and desirable future, uh, or can we, or do we want to go in a direction that's, that's uh, um, more like where we seem to be headed, uh, or something that's a little more, uh, <clears throat> more policy oriented? So we use those scenarios to look at what would be the impact on ecosystem service values uh, under each of those four scenarios. And here you can see, uh, again, the same sort of spreadsheet. 
where we look at the values in 1997, the values in 2011, and what the ultimate values would be in, uh, in each of those scenarios based on the land use changes and the management changes that those scenarios would entail. And you can see if we stick with business as usual or a for fortress world, we can look at a continuing decline uh, in those ecosystem services, but we can uh, make the transition and begin to rebuild and restore uh, those services uh, back, to, back to levels that exceed where we were in 1907. And that's gonna vary a bit by country depending on uh, different conditions uh, that, that occur in different parts of the world uh, and what, <clears throat> uh, what kinds of transitions need to be made. So we, need to, we can reverse desertification to a certain extent. Uh, we certainly need to deal with uh, climate change in order to make this, this great transition. So that's a big underlying uh, element uh, in, that, in that thing. Um, the other element that, um, that, that we need to worry about is, is uh, how do we manage these collective resources? How do we manage the commons in a way that, that is, uh, is effective? Uh, uh, we, we certainly don't want to uh, privatize many of these public goods. Uh, we want to deal with them as, commun as common assets. And Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who some of you may know, um, did a lot of, won the Nobel Prize in economics really for her work on common property uh, and common asset management uh, in traditional communities and sort of came up with a set of uh, clear principles uh, for how, how commons management can work uh, in, in these situations. <clears throat> and that's the, the list on the, uh, on the left there. Uh, you do need clearly defined boundaries uh, for, for common property, but, but you need to, to prop, uh, give property rights to the community, not necessarily to the uh, to, to individuals. Um, there needs to be proportional equivalence between benefits and costs, collective choice arrangements, and a whole series of, of characteristics uh, that these kinds of common asset uh, management systems can have. And we're working now uh, to try to develop um, to more generalize this, this idea, create uh, common asset trusts as a way of managing uh, community assets, including things like the atmosphere and, uh, and the oceans. Uh, so one initiative is this idea that we should think of the atmosphere as a community asset uh, that we all own together. Uh, and, and there are some legal principles, even to back this up, something called the public trust doctrine uh, that says that um, governments have the responsibility uh, to protect these common assets for, for, uh, for public good. Uh, so how do we do that? Can we can begin to charge those who damage the atmosphere and put those funds into a fund, into a trust fund, uh, an Earth Atmospheric Trust, and use that money then to restore uh, ecosystems, uh, to plant trees, to restore wetlands, et cetera, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, uh, and also to, to hasten the transition to, uh, to renewable energy sources. Uh, so it's a, <clears throat> another way of thinking of these assets as community assets and managing them in that way. And I think this has also been proposed uh, for, for the oceans or other major uh, remaining uh, open access uh, community. Uh, the problem with the atmosphere is, is, not, is, is that it isn't still an open access resource. It doesn't satisfy Austin's first principle that there has to be clear, clear boundaries. And this, the question is uh, who, who owns those, those, uh, those rights? And, and we're arguing that that should that these uh, public goods should be owned by the public and managed in that way. Uh, we also, I think, need to build much broader and much stronger alliances among all of the different groups uh, that are uh, that are working in this in this direction, uh, that are that are working to build a sustainable and desirable future. And one that I've been involved with is called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. I encourage you to take a look at their their website. Uh, and look at some of the things that are going on there. there. There are a huge number of individuals, groups around the world, I think, that, that share these, these common goals. How do we build that, uh, that shared vision? Um, how do we uh, accelerate the transition uh, to this sustainable and desirable future? So, thank you very much. You still there? Mm -hmm. We just <laughs> slow. We're just clipping on the moderator right now. Okay. So, Jorge, would you okay. like to begin with the Q and A? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Costanza. Uh, we enjoyed a lot your your presentation. Um, and do remind me that the, this paper in nineteen 
97 was uh, so inspiring for me that I decided to start uh, doing environmental economics as part of my <laughs> career. So it is, uh, I really enjoyed the, your presentation. Um, so far, I have uh, some questions for you. I will start uh, with this one from Natalia Zapata. She is asking uh, about how could you analyze and value those ecosystem services linked to coastal ecosystems all over the world? Which information did you take into account? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I showed a graph of all of those thousands of studies that have been done on different ecosystem services. And so we did a meta-analysis, essentially, uh, as assembling all of those studies and, um, and putting the, the information into, into this um, uh, meta-analysis, if you will. So it's, it wasn't any one study, it was really you know, uh, th thousands of studies. In the 1997 paper, we did the same sort of thing. Uh, we had, at that time, only a couple of hundred studies, however, uh, so much, much less um, <clears throat> information. Uh, but but since then the number of studies have been increasing rapidly, and so we can we can do a much more a much better job. Um, and also, you know, uh, I think the, the way the, the quality of some of those studies has also been increasing. I pointed out the uh, the way that we're approaching the the uh, uh, value of coastal wetlands. Uh, we're now working on a, study, a global extending that that sort of analysis to the global scale. Uh, so we had. You know, in the U.S. case that I mentioned, we had 32 storms, I think, that we could use in the study. In the global case, now we can go back much further back. We have a better database. We have uh, on the order of a thousand storms that we can that we can look at globally. So we can get much more statistical power, uh, you know, in the in the studies. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question from Andres Felipe Sanchez. Uh, he's uh, saying, uh, "I really like your conference." I have a question. How can we avoid the undervaluation of ecosystem services so as not to cause an increase in their degradation? Well, I think we've been undervaluing them for, for decades, if not centuries now. Uh, so I think just to, to recognize that um, we're making estimates of their value and we recognize at all, at all points that those are probably always going to be uh, some kind of underestimate because you cannot get uh, get everything there. So I think we should, uh, you know, take to heart the precautionary principle and say that um, we should give, you know, some, some, uh, some additional uh, uh, <coughs> leeway and recognize that, that, uh, that we're, not, uh, we're not making a, a full assessment. We're, we're always making a partial assessment and, and a partial estimate. Uh, but <coughs> I found that even when you do that, uh, the numbers are, are significant. And they force people to, to confront the fact that they're uh, they're losing something that's much more valuable than they had given given the credit for. Uh, so <clears throat> I hope that that answers the question. You do need to take uh, take these things, you know, with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think uh, it's the uh, the number of grains of salt that we've been able to accumulate is pretty big. And once you put that on a scale, uh, it, it often tips the balance uh, toward a more, more more conservative decision more conservation-oriented decision. Yeah, thank you. And in, in some way related with this, uh, there is another question from uh, Professor Sven Sea from Universidad Nacional de Colombia. And he is asking, how can we jump from lip service to the importance of ecosystem services to real action? Sorry, say that last thing again, from ecosystem services to, oh, to real action. To real action. Well, yeah, I think, I think we have uh, done that to a certain extent, uh, because once, once you've made these uh, values more apparent, uh, it can influence uh, policy decisions. Um, I think this, uh, this idea of payment for ecosystem services, um, uh, economic incentives to, to, do the, to do the right thing and to conserve natural resources has certainly become a very popular uh, way, of, way of implementing uh, these, these ideas. And I mentioned at the end, the idea of um, taking that one step further, we're actually working with uh, Costa Rica uh, in updating and doing the next phase of their, their payment system and uh, to encouraging them to think of, of their uh, natural capital assets as community, community trusts and how to, to uh, 
to uh, to use that sort of mechanism to change uh, uh, to change behavior and to have, have better uh, cons conservation um, goals and, and outcomes. So I think there's a lot of activity in in in, uh, in using this this approach uh, to to stimulate uh, and to encourage more and better uh, conservation. Yes, perfect. Uh, I have uh, another question from Daniel Alejandro Quevedo. Uh, he's saying, well, thanks for the presentation. And the question is, do you know anything about how the ecosystem service change in the South Hemisphere, in particular Latin America? Or do you know some others? Yes, well, um, our, our papers were global in, um, <clears throat> in, in uh, uh, extent. And so we did cover uh, Latin America, South America as part of that. Um, <clears throat> however, um, most of the studies that we actually base those extrapolations on were done, were done in, in, uh, in other places. So I don't know right now, but I think the number of studies in, in South and Central America have been increasing um, as well at the, at the same rate. So we're getting, getting more information uh, you know, with, with time. Um, a former uh, a PhD student of mine just looked at the, uh, we, we showed the uh, future projections of ecosystem services, those sort of future scenarios. And he, he did a, uh, specifically a study of, of Latin and Central America. So if you're interested, I could send, um, I could send around a, a copy of that, of that study. Yeah, perfect. You're right. We just finished also a, a systematic review of studies uh, for evaluation of uh, coastal protection from a, a ecosystem and uh, through uh, erosion control and flood control. Uh, so yeah, there are some mainly applied to the Caribbean region. So yeah. there are some literature now uh, moving on, on this topic now. I know there's so there is so much literature out there now. It's hard yeah. to keep track of, of who's doing what anymore. But uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I have another question from Julian Prato from Universidad Nacional uh, Caribbean uh, campus, and he says, uh, "Thank you, Professor Costanza, for this amazing talk." And his his question is, "How marine science can contribute to increase the knowledge about ecosystem functions?" So we can better value our natural capital, and how can we increase our impact on decision making and politics? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think marine science has a lot to contribute, and I think it's one of the understudied uh, areas or biomes uh, in terms of ecosystem uh, services. Coastal systems, I think, have gotten a lot of attention, uh, but but uh, open water, uh, <clears throat> not not as much. So I think there's, there's a lot more work to do there. And I think part of the issue is uh, to build more transdisciplinary teams you know, to look at these, these issues. So we're not just studying individual species, we're not just studying you know, even the whole marine ecosystem, we're studying the marine ecosystem in interaction with uh, the, the human uh, economy and the, and the human system. So how do you how do you look at the whole the whole system in a more integrated way? I think that's the that's the underlying challenge. And so you know our our academic institutions uh, don't really encourage that kind of <laughs> transdisciplinary uh, integration. We're still stuck in our disciplinary silos. Uh, so I think that's that's really the big challenge going forward. How do you build those bridges? How do you build uh, sort of uh, and more, more transdisciplinary approaches. How do we work, work together on this, these common problems? And there are, there are ways to do that. One, uh, one way that I've been involved with is the, uh, this idea of, uh, of a synthesis center. Uh, so our 1997 paper was done at the uh, National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Santa Barbara, uh, which was, I think, one of the first of these kinds of institutions where uh -huh. people are brought together not to you know, not to create more new data, but basically to synthesize information across disciplines, you know, around a, a, a question, uh, like the one that we had, you know, what's the value of all the world's ecosystem services? Well, we brought together this group of researchers and, and you know, sat together and uh, for, for a couple of weeks and tried to pull, pull all that information together. So I think uh, <clears throat> that kind of institution is something that we could, uh, we could use much more of, you know, so uh, building, 
uh, synthesis centers into our universities, into our mm -hmm. research organizations overall, and having that be a, a it's been shown to be uh, a really important and productive way of doing these kinds of, of answering these kinds of questions. Uh, so just, uh, but finding that the financial and other support to to uh, to do it, I think, is the challenge. Yeah, probably this is one of the most challenging issues that we have to 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 face. This. Uh, the rest of this century if we want to move into to conserving the natural ecosystems right uh, corinne gonzalez uh, has a more uh, specific question she is asking have you studied other ecosystem services provided by the wetlands beyond storms and do you know if they have a special importance for the tropical ecosystems uh, the answer to those, those questions is yes in those cases <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I just gave the storm protection as one example of how to sort of work through, you know, for one ecosystem and one ecosystem service. But but uh, like I said, in all of those thirty-two thousand papers that have been published, um, <clears throat> people are looking at the whole this whole range, this whole list of ecosystem services, uh, you know, from uh, food supply and fisheries, you know, to uh, recreation, to you know, aesthetic benefits. Uh, to regulating services like storm protection and carbon sequestration. So, you know, uh, in general, there's, you know, a list of, of 17 to 20 different specific services. Uh, I think uh, one of the issues is, well, you look at each of those services separately and then try to aggregate them together. Really, you should be looking at the whole system as a, in a more integrated way. And so I mentioned this idea of, of uh, integrated modeling, and we have done some, some studies there. Uh, particularly at the at the global scale, uh, but we're working now on a on a farm scale uh, integrated model that tries to put together, you know, how these systems function uh, over time you know, with a dynamic kind of simulation model. Uh, what happens to the stocks and flows of different uh, types of capital assets, and and how do they impact uh, sustainable well-being? Uh, so it uh, it can be done. I'd be happy to to uh, well. If people are interested, they can take a look at the uh, my personal website, which I, I gave the, uh, uh, the the URL for that, and they can download uh, some of those papers from from there. Great, probably uh, we can uh, write it down in the in the chat. Uh, yeah, we can have it. Yes, here I can, I can put it there for you. I can put it in the chat. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, another question from Pilar Erron. Um, she says, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. And the question is, given the overall high value of the benefit cost ratio of preserving ecosystems, why do you think it's so difficult that governments make decisions based on that? It is just our short term view of the world as humans? Mm. Yeah, partly. I think partly um, they have they haven't. Uh, but they're beginning to recognize this. I think quite quite uh, quite well uh, these days. This idea of nature-based solutions. Uh, I think you may have heard that that term, but I think people uh, are beginning to to recognize that. We've been working with the um, National Australia Bank and the uh, GIZ, the German Development Agency, uh, but the banks now and insurance companies. I think they're really becoming. Uh, interested in this idea. So um, NAB, the National Australia Bank, uh, makes loans to farmers. They want to know, are the farmers, you know, uh, taking care of their natural capital assets? Because they know that by doing that, they're going to make their farm more sustainable, it's going to have better results in the long term, uh, both from traditional farm products point of view, but also in providing these um, community assets and ecosystem services. So they can, they can uh, use green bonds, for example, to uh, to get people to invest in this common goods and they can also um, you know, uh, <clears throat> invest in farms uh, so they would uh, that would affect their their decisions about who to loan money to and how at what rate uh, based on how how well or badly uh, the farmers are protecting their soil their, you know, their other uh, natural capital assets so i think it's beginning to have uh, much more influence in that and there are certainly some governments uh, in the uh, you know the, the EU, I think has has brought this issue uh, uh, to the to the fore, and so that we're uh, they they have a whole program for for, uh, for monitoring and 
uh, utilizing uh, ecosystem services in their decision making. Uh, even the United States in the Obama, Obama administration, there was a, a memo uh, that said that all public agencies uh, were, were required to take ecosystem services uh, you know, into account in their, in their decision making. So unfortunately, that that probably is not no longer <laughs> being implemented. <laughs> but maybe, but hopefully that will change soon, <laughs> and we might go back to a situation where, where these things are are, are given to higher uh, higher credibility. And certainly, the the climate issues, you know, and the the, uh, the recent fires in California and Australia, and uh, you know, hurricanes are, are increasing in, in intensity. So I think people are they can no longer ignore uh, the the fact that that uh, we rely on uh, these natural ecosystems for our sustainable well-being and mm -hmm. uh, bring, that, bring that into the planning uh, decision. So I think things are changing and hopefully they're changing quickly enough. Yes, yes. Uh, I have a, a, some other question related with the, uh, the, the same, well, with, with this topic of, of growth. Um, I have a, from Catalina Gonzalez. She's saying a very inspiring I am truly touched to listen to you after so many years of learning from you. And she would like to ask if indigenous philosophies such as uh, buen vivir, good and plentiful living, could actually be included in a scheme of valuation of ecosystem services. <coughs> Sorry, which, say that again, good and plenty? Good and plentiful living. Good and plentiful living. Um, I think what what Brett brings to mind is this uh, well-being economy alliance uh, that I think there there are many different um, ideas out there that that really when you look at them are fairly similar uh, so this idea of donut economics or well-being uh, economics or ecological economics uh, <clears throat> all of these things are, are talking about similar kinds of things using different terminology coming from a different you know, starting point um, I think the goal of the Well-Being Economy Alliance is to try to bring those, all of those ideas together uh, and to say, you know, we need to, to be an alliance. Um, we need to build uh, the, you know, the united front uh, that has enough uh, mass, critical mass to, to, uh, to sort of change, change the system uh, in the direction that we, we want to go in. So yes, I would say all of those kinds of efforts uh, are good, uh, but I think the challenge now is how do we how do we bring them together and, and not think of them as separate, different things, you know, but, but as really part, part of the same and contributing to the same overall uh, goal. So I would encourage uh, <clears throat> the good and plenty people to, to join, look at and join the, the, the uh, Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Yeah, and, and in that way, probably the, the, the next question will complement this. Rafael is asking, are there any countries which recognize that we should not continue thinking on economic growth, but in reduction of the use of resources, so yeah. that they invite the United Nations to stop the idea of continued economic growth? Mm -hmm. um, again, back to the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, there is a group of governments, uh, the Wellbeing Economy Government Group, led by Scotland, and I would encourage you to, to Google um, the TED Talk by Nicola Sturgeon, who's the uh, First Minister of Scotland, where she talks explicitly about this idea of getting away from uh, focus on just GDP growth and, and toward a focus on well-being. And that initial group of countries includes uh, Scotland, New Zealand, um, Iceland, and uh, I think Wales has joined, Finland is close to joining, I think Costa Rica will probably, will probably join at some, po some point soon. Uh, so Colombia would be, would be a, 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 another country. But the idea there is to build out that part of the alliance as well, to have countries that have acknowledged that their goal is not simply maximize GDP growth. I could give a whole talk about, about this as well, but, uh, but to, folk, to refocus on well-being and what actually does contribute to well-being. You know that, that GDP in recent decades, uh, when you look at alternative indicators like the genuine progress indicator, which accounts for the distribution of, of that GDP, you know, the inequality that's been, that's been growing when you look at the environmental damages that that GDP growth has caused, including uh, climate, other, other losses. When you bring those things into account, uh, we're not making genuine progress and haven't been for, for decades. 
not, you know, we're, we're spinning our wheels faster, but, but the negative side effect of that are, mm -hmm. are, uh, are <clears throat> netting out to, to zero progress. And I think people, people feel that as well. When you look at surveys of people's life satisfaction, that hasn't been improving either. Uh, so we're, you know, we're following the wrong guide these days. We need to get off of, of this addiction to GDP growth mm -hmm. and really, really refocus uh, on on well-being and what contributes to that. And sometimes that may need, to, you know, may lead to GDP increasing. Sometimes it may lead to GDP decreasing. I don't think people really care about GDP. They care about well-being. And so that's what we should be measuring, and that's what we should be trying to improve. And certainly by uh, reducing inequality has a, has a big effect on improving well-being. Uh, in reducing the impacts on the environment has a big effect on, on well-being, as we've been trying to articulate you know, by measuring the benefits of those ecosystem services and natural capital, which are left out of the GDP accounting altogether. Yeah, and, and probably with, with, this, um, with this intervention, you are answering also uh, a question from David Sanchez. Anyway, I will, I will ask you if you want to, to complement in some way. Uh, he is asking, uh, can you mention something about the shift from a GDP indicator into other indicators that include ecosystem services and other types of value dimensions? Mm -hmm. Can we expect that change to really occur? I mean, that include other dimensions, capital, social, nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of interest in, in making that shift. And there are many different alternative indicators out there now, um, <clears throat> uh, many of which do, do try to include inequality and natural capital and social capital. So, um, and there are, like I said, a few governments that are taking that seriously, uh, probably the most uh, <clears throat> uh, Explicit one is New Zealand these days, who has a you know a well-being budget. So their budget is is arranged so that so that they can improve well-being. Now, coming to some broader consensus on what those indicators should be, I think uh, you know, the, the consensus around GDP as the primary indicator you know, of, of, of economic success back in the you know, post-war period uh, sort of led us in a certain certain direction. Uh, and I think to, to overcome that addiction, we need to, to build this consensus or rebuild the consensus around alternative indicators. And I think that's what's, what's happening now. Uh, there has been a lot of, a lot of work and, and discussion uh, around that. And, and you could think of the, the SDGs, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, almost as a, as a, st as a good step in that direction. Uh, of those 17 goals, you know, there's one that's still about economic growth, but at least it's, it's moderated, you know, to be inclusive and sustainable. Uh, so, uh, but all of the other 16 goals, you know, um, are probably, uh, make, some are positive, but some are negatively, uh, you know, influenced by this focus on GDP growth. So at least the broadening of the goals to all of the things that contribute to well-being, GDP is one of them, but it's a, it's a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. The end is this broader uh, sub this broader collection of goals and sustainable uh, human and natural system well-being overall. Yeah. <coughs> uh, there is another question from Alfonso Langle. He's asking how COVID is going to affect the supply and demand of ecosystem services. And in that sense, how populism is affecting the offer of ecosystem services in the United States Russia, Mexico, and Brazil. That last part, how population, did you say? How populism. Pol pollution or population? Populism. The, the population, number of people. No, no, populism. Um, populism. Populism, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, um, <clears throat> well, I don't, I think that that, <clears throat> this, this whole, whole sort of shift to the right in, in many countries is really a, uh, uh, well, I think it's, it's hopefully uh, just a, a short-term uh, digression uh, from, from the direction that I think the, the world really uh, needs to and wants to go to if we're going to create a sustainable future. Uh, so you know, we're, going to, we're going to need to um, shift away from fossil fuels and you know, toward renewable energy. We're going to need to 
reduce inequality. We're going to need to do all of the things that are embedded in the, the, uh, the SDGs and this you know, sort of great transition scenario that, that I talked about. Uh, and so uh, those sort of uh, political movements, I think, are preventing that, that, move, that move, but I think underlying uh, uh, much of that, the general population, if you survey them, uh, <clears throat> really don't want to go <laughs> in that direction. We did a, a, um, <clears throat> a survey in Australia, you can find on, a, on my website, where we looked at um, <clears throat> four alternative futures for the country. Uh, basically, those same four visions that, that I mentioned in the, uh, the, the, the Great Transition Scenario, slightly different names that we use for them. Uh, you know, so we had a community well-being scenario, which was largely uh, the SDGs versus a, you know, a sort of business as usual and a policy reform kind of scenario. Um, and the, the vast majority, roughly 70% of the population, really preferred uh, you know, the, the community well-being, great transition, uh, maybe with the mix of policy reform uh, going forward. So I think if you survey the global population, the direction that we're going is not the direction that they want the world to go. They want a world that's more like the sustainable development goals. Uh, how to get that, you know, in a, in a, in a democracy, that would, that would be uh, <clears throat> the obvious conclusion. Uh, the problem is because of special interests and, and other influences on the political process, we don't have real democracy in, in many, if any countries. Uh, so, <clears throat> so moving more in that direction, I think, is, is uh, probably what's required. How do we get the will of the people, really, to, to, uh, to be implemented? And I think to do that, and we need to, to build this shared vision much more, uh, much more uh, actively. <clears throat> I'm not sure that the general population has even heard of the Sustainable Development Goals, for example. Uh, I don't think they recognize that they're there are alternative futures that, that we, we can choose, you know, which of those futures <clears throat> we want to pursue. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> getting that message out to the general public, I think, is, is probably one of the more important steps. How do we build this shared vision? How do we make it clear that there are alternative futures? How do we, how do we uh, put that choice um, before people in a more uh, comprehensive way? Not just voting on the next candidate, but say, what kind of world do we really want? Uh, as I said in one of my early slides, you know, how do you build that broad consensus about the world that we want? I'm not sure if that answered the question, but <laughs> sorry. Well, no, I think that uh, it has been a very productive and uh, very fruitful uh, discussion and, uh, for uh, a group of uh, participants in this conference from some different uh, uh, backgrounds, this uh, idea of transdisciplinary works uh, really is uh, it is important, uh, and, and and to show how economics and how social sciences can play a role in this um, discussion and proposing solutions for uh, reducing the degradation of ecosystem and ecosystem services. Uh, I think this is a, a very very welcome uh, presentation that you have. Uh, provided to us, Professor Costanza. So I just want to, again, thank you for um, being with us, uh, for being part of this, of this uh, conference. And uh, we are uh, really um, motivated for your words, for um, continue working on those different activities that uh, could be helpful for reducing the degradation of the ecosystem and ecosystem services.